Welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each week, Sam breaks down the highest yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Hello and welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Basics with your host, Sam Smith. The goal of this podcast is to cover the highest yield topics on the MCAT and provide you with some sort of insight into the questions that the MCAT really likes to ask. This podcast is going to cover social stratification, which is actually a really important topic for the MCAT, and I meant to do this podcast a long time ago. It's kind of just been sitting in the uh, topic queue, but uh, I cover a bunch of different topics in this podcast. First, I'm going to go through a bunch of different terms that you're likely to see regarding social stratification, and I'll give examples, I'll I'll define them, Uh, but I think a lot of the stuff, especially on the psych soch section of the MCAT, is really just being able to understand these different concepts and being able to recognize them and apply them. Um, you know, things like gentrification, prejudice, social capital, etc. So that's the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define a bunch of terms for you, give examples and definitions, and then I'm going to talk about social classes. And then lastly, I'll talk about social stratification in healthcare. And this material is going to show up in one out of the four MCAT sections. That's going to be the psych soch section. And this is actually a pretty high yield topic. You're definitely likely to see this come up on the MCAT. And of course, you'll see this stuff come up in interviews for medical school, during medical school as a physician, um, which honestly can't be said about a lot of the other um, MCAT topics. As I said in the intro, the first part of this podcast is really just going to be defining a bunch of terms and then, of course, giving examples so that you can kind of understand each of them a little bit better. And I'm going to go through a bunch of terms. I'll define social stratification, prejudice, discrimination, stereotype, stereotype threat. I will also talk about status. I'll talk about power as well as the six different types of power to know for the MCAT. I'll talk about social capital as well as the other types of capital. I'll talk about gentrification, poverty, you know, what's absolute poverty versus relative poverty. And then I'll get into the next segment on social class. All right, so in general, social stratification is a society's categorization of its people into different rankings of socio- socioeconomic levels based upon factors like income, power, net wealth, race, education, um, and more, depending upon what society we're looking at. And later in the podcast, I'll get into a little bit on how we measure social stratification. I think that's pretty interesting. Um, And so something I've seen come up a few times on the MCAT is knowing the difference between prejudice, discrimination, and then stereotypes. So there are three different things. They all kind of have the same meaning. You know, if you don't really understand it very well, you could easily mistake one for the other. So let's start with prejudice. Prejudice is a positive or negative evaluation of another person based upon their perceived group membership, i.e. you are evaluating someone in a positive or negative light based upon their class, their race, their gender, their religion, their sexual orientation, um, or their ability. So, for example, if I were a prejudiced human being, you know, maybe I'd be walking down the street and I would see a woman and I'd say, you know what, I don't like them. They're a woman. I'm, you know, they're, they're not part of my group. Um, and just have kind of negative feelings about that person just because they were a woman. Um, or, you know, it could be a different race than mine. And maybe I would say, oh, I don't like that person. They're, um, you know, some other race. And, and so basically I would have no evidence to dislike this person. You know, they could be a wonderful individual. But because of whatever group they belonged to that I didn't, I kind of prejudged them. So one way to kind of think about prejudice is to think prejudged, um, which is one way I like to think about it. Now, in contrast to that, the Oxford English Dictionary defines stereotype as a widely held but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. So it's really just a generalized belief about a particular group of people. And there's a million different examples of stereotypes that I can think about, but you know, one may be that elderly individuals are bad drivers, or that blondes are dumb, or that maybe athletes are dumb. Um... You know, I'm, I'm sure you can think of your own too. But really, the thing to remember here is that stereotypes are this generalized idea you have about a particular group. It's not necessarily this overall bad or good feeling you have about a particular group. It's you know some belief or some idea that you have about that group that may be true, 
it may not be true. You know, it's not always 100% true, but it can be true in some cases. You know, I'm sure there are individuals that are elderly that are bad drivers. Obviously, you know, maybe they can't see very well, they're a bad driver. But that's not the case all the time. And lastly, discrimination is defined as an action or practice that excludes, disadvantages, or differentiates between individuals uh, or groups of individuals on the basis of some perceived trait. And I think the big takeaway for discrimination is that it's an action, right? Both prejudice and stereotypes are just thoughts, right? You're just thinking in your head that you don't like some group of people or you have some idea about a group of people in general, but discrimination is an action against that group of people for whatever perceived difference you think about them or perceived dislike you have for them. So again, the difference between discrimination and prejudice is action. And I think one interesting and a historical example of all three of these different concepts is in a conflict that occurred in Northern Ireland that was known as the Troubles. And this conflict started around 1968 and lasted about 30 years. And it was essentially between two different groups of people. One group of people were Protestants in terms of their religion, and they were also unionists and What that meant is that they wanted Northern Ireland to actually remain part of the United Kingdom. And then in contrast to to them, there was a group of people known as the Irish nationalists. They were Catholics and they wanted Northern Ireland to actually leave the UK and join a united Ireland. And these groups of people really did not like each other. Um, You know, it was kind of the Catholics versus the Protestants. And it was easy to look at it as kind of like a religious conflict, but it was more of the fact that uh, they didn't agree with the direction that the country wanted to go in terms of staying part of the UK or joining Ireland. And so anyways, these groups of people really grew to dislike each other. And even though they didn't necessarily know these people personally, they judged them, you know, just based upon the fact that they were of a different religion, they'd say, I don't like that person. And that's what's known as prejudice. And eventually the Irish Protestants began to stereotype the Irish Catholics as these heavy smokers, heavy drinkers, um, and just kind of anytime they'd see one of the Catholics, you know, they just assumed, you know, you're a heavy drinker, you're a heavy smoker. And I should just mention too that the Catholics, uh, people who are nationalists, you know, that wanted to join Ireland, Um, they were also the minority in this population. And so over time, what happened is that these Catholics were actually discriminated against and they were less likely to be given to be given certain jobs, especially in government. And so obviously that's a form of discrimination, um, right? These Irish Protestants are kind of taking an action to prevent the Catholics from gaining jobs. And there was obviously a lot more of discrimination that happened. You know, there was a lot of violence. A lot of people ended up dying. Um, But it's just an interesting example that shows that these three concepts are all related, right? One may lead to the other, may lead to the other, or, you know, in in different orders. So um, interesting historical example. And one thing I didn't mention was the concept of stereotype threat. And stereotype threat is defined as a situation in which people feel at risk of conforming to some stereotype about their social group, which in effect causes them to actually conform to the stereotype. And this is a bit of a weird concept, but I'll give you some examples and I'll actually go back to one of the original experiments that kind of showed this effect. Um, So if you don't understand by that definition, just hold on for a sec. So one of the original studies that showed stereotype threat was done in 1995, the year I was born, and it was done by Claude Steele and Joshua Arnson. And they got the idea for this study when they noticed that African American students were not performing as well as white students on the GRE, which is the graduate exam for um, you know, normal grad school. And I think a lot of schools are getting away from it now. But back then, everyone was taking it to get into graduate school. And so what they did to kind of understand why this was the case is that they took a pool of African-American and white students and they split this pool into three groups so that each group had um, white students and African-American students. And in group one, they described the GRE as, or I think it was a section of the GRE, they described it as a 
diagnostic test of intellectual ability. So that's group one. Group two, they described the test as a laboratory problem-solving task that was non-diagnostic of ability. And then in group three, the test was described again as a laboratory problem-solving test that was non-diagnostic of ability. And then further, they told the students to look at it as a challenge. And in the end, all three groups received the same exact test or passage or whatever it was they were being tested upon. And what they noticed was that in groups two and three, the scores of the white subjects and of the African-American subjects were not statistically different, whereas the subjects in group one actually had statistically different scores. The white students scored higher than the African-American students with a p-value around 0.03. And what the authors of the study concluded was that stereotype threat was the reason then that the African-Americans scored lower on this test um, in this group one condition. In other words, what they were saying is that these students actually internalized the stereotype that they don't perform well on standardized tests that are there to measure their ability, um, and therefore they scored lower on that test. So essentially they're saying that, you know, over time these students have heard that, you know, you don't do good at the standardized tests that measure your aptitude. Um, And so because they have that thought in their head, then they end up actually confirming that stereotype when they take the test. And so in a way, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And there's been many other studies done to show the same effect. You know, one that comes to mind is this study where they looked at the performance of women versus men on some kind of math test. And before the test was taken, they told the women, you know, women tend to not score as high on math tests as men in one group and the other group they didn't. And um, you got the, you saw the same effect. The next term that I want to talk about here is status. And, you know, in a sec, I'll talk about ascribed versus achieved status. But in general, uh, status is defined as an individual's position, often relative to others in a group of society, is characterized by certain benefits and responsibilities as determined by their rank or role. In other words, someone's status is their value or their rank in a society or in a group. So take, for example, a research lab. You know, I work in a research lab, and each individual in the lab has their own status, right? Depending upon their uh, number of degrees that they have, you know, their experience, whatever it may be, each person has a status. So at the most basic level, you can look at the number of degrees, right? The PI, who is the principal investigator of the lab, runs the lab, and they, they typically have the highest status, and they typically have the most degrees. You know, the individual who runs my lab is an MD, PhD, so he's got a dual degree, um, and he, he runs the whole lab. And then you have people who are staff scientists, and they typically have some kind of graduate degree, usually a PhD. And on top of that, they have experience. They've been researchers for typically you know, 10, 15 years. Then you have postdocs, and postdocs as well have a graduate degree, they have a PhD, but they don't have much experience, so they come next. Then you have graduate students who typically have some type of undergraduate degree but are working on a graduate degree. Then you have postbacs, which are post-bachelorettes, which are just people who have graduated, they have got their bachelor's degree, but they're not necessarily in a graduate school program. So they're probably the next level. And then under them, you have undergraduate researchers researchers who have not got their undergraduate degree yet, um, but are you know doing research to get experience. And so that's all to say that in a research lab, status is typically based upon the number of degrees that you have or your experience. Um, and status can either be ascribed or achieved. Status that's ascribed is status that's given at birth. An example there is like that you're born into a royal family and now you're a king or a queen. Status can also be achieved, and that is when status is gained on the basis of achievements and on the basis of merit. So, you know, that's when you've worked your whole life to become uh, a PI of a lab, for instance, a principal investigator. Now you're the head of a lab and now you run that shit. I don't know if that's how PIs feel, but. That's how I would feel if I was a PI. 
The last status term I want to talk about is status consistency. And that's a situation in which an individual status is similar across multiple categories, such as education, occupation, income, etc. And that's a pretty common sense kind of definition, right? You see status consistency, their status is just consistent across categories. You know, maybe say you're a politician and your occupation puts you pretty high in terms of status. And then you also graduated from Harvard and you also make $250,000 a year. Um, you know, that would put you pretty high status in terms of all these different categories, i.e., you would have status consistency. The next term I want to talk about is power. And I'll also talk here about the different types of power to know for the MCAT. Um, in sociological terms, power is defined as the capacity of an individual to influence the behavior of others. And there are six different types of power that you should know for the MCAT. And these are called French and Raven's five forms of power, which, yes, there's six of them. It's called the five forms. That's because there was five and then after French and Raven had come up with these five, they realized that they left one out, and so that was the sixth. Um, but anyways, the first is legitimate power, and that is elected, selected, or appointed positions of power. A good example of this is in elected officials in government. You know, we elect them, and in their positions they have power, they can sway people's beliefs, sway their behavior, etc., the second type of power is called coercive power, and that is the use of force to gain compliance. And I like to think about this as like a kidnapper. Like say, for instance, and God forbid that somebody was to kidnap you, uh, they would do it using force, right? You're not just going to willingly go along with them um, without some threat of force at least. The third type of power is called reward power, and this is denial or offer of a reward for desired behavior. And this is like you and your pet dog, right? You hold reward power over your dog because you can offer it doggy treats to, you know, sit or do some behavior that you want it to do. So that's reward power. The fourth kind of power is called expert power. And that's power that is based on a special experience or set of skills that an individual may hold. An example here is like a car mechanic. Right, They have the special skill set to fix problems in cars and understand how cars work. And you know, Not many people other than car mechanics really have a good understanding of how cars work or how to fix them. You know, There's people obviously that enjoy doing that and know how to do it, but I don't think a ton of people know how to do that. And so these car mechanics can, can kind of have a power over you, especially when you, know, you have an oil change or something, and then they tell you your car is you know, two centimeters away from breaking down and exploding and killing everyone within two miles, unless you fix this you know, $4,000 timing belt. It, and you're kind of likely to do that because you have no idea you know, if, if that's true or not. And um, that's all based on the fact that they have this expert power or, or this power based upon their special experience and skill set. The fifth type of power is called referent power, and that is power that comes along with affiliation with a specific group. An example here is the power that celebrities may hold. So celebrities are part of this special group of people that you you see in movies and a lot of people idolize and a lot of people see them as almost these like superhero role model figures. And so because of that, they hold this special referent power um, over people. The sixth and final type of power to know is called informational power. And this is power based upon holding knowledge that others want. So you have information, other people want this, and they're willing to give up something or they're willing to change their behavior to get that knowledge. Um, And one example that comes to my mind is part of what makes social media companies so powerful, right? Social media companies are collecting data on everyone all the time. And then what they can do with that data, which is highly sought after and highly wanted, is they can sell it. And, you know, that builds up their company. And over time, they become this big, powerful company based upon having Um, this information or this knowledge that other companies or other people want. 
And obviously, that's probably a simplification of how these companies have, got, have gotten so big and powerful, and um, you know they sell advertisements too. But that's just kind of what comes to my mind when I think about informational power. All right, so those are the six different types of power to know for the MCAT. Again, that's legitimate power, coercive power, reward power, expert power, referent power, and informational power. The next term I want to talk about is social capital. So social capital is a type of capital that provides access to resources that are embedded in social relationships. So it has a lot to do with your network of friends, your network of connections that you have around you uh, that would enable you to have opportunities that you would not have otherwise. So this is a little bit of an abstract idea, but I think a good example of this is, is what people tend to do when they want to find a new job. What they do is they'll tap into their social capital in order to find job opportunities, right? So they'll go, they'll talk to different connections, um, you know, that they have, you know, friends of their friends, maybe their own friends themselves have job opportunities, you know, maybe your dad's best friend is the CEO of a Nike. And so because of that connection, you know, you have plenty of job opportunities that this guy can hook you up with. Um, so you, you can say in that situation that you're using your social capital to tap into your contacts to find job opportunities. And I think another thing that kind of helps me understand what social capital is, is to understand what social capital is not. So there's three other types of capital that you should know um, for the MCAT. Um, the first is financial capital, and that's just money. And then you have cultural capital, and that's things like shared outlooks, shared beliefs, and knowledge that's passed down. And then you have human capital, which is education and job training. So again, social capital is capital that provides access to resources that are embedded in your social relationships. The next term that I want to mention is gentrification. And the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines gentrification as the process of repairing and rebuilding homes and businesses in a deteriorating area such as an urban neighborhood that is accompanied by an influx of middle class or affluent people and that often results in the displacement of earlier, usually poorer residents. And this is especially a problem in bigger cities. So I live right outside, right outside of Washington, D.C., and um, Washington, D.C. is a prime example of gentrification. Um, what happens is that you have these poor neighborhoods where houses are deteriorating in some capacity, and eventually what happens is these developers come in and they maybe knock down houses and then build up these new nicer apartment buildings and this attracts a more affluent clientele that come in and you know that drives up the housing prices and eventually you get more nice buildings built and more affluent people move into this area and eventually what happens is you push out all the poor people from that area and this cycle just kind of repeats itself right you're pushing these poor communities further and further outside of the city as you continually gentrify these areas so that's gentrification. The next term that I want to discuss, and it's very related, is poverty. So in terms of sociology, poverty is defined as a social condition in which a person lacks the resources necessary for basic survival or necessary to meet a minimum level of living standards expected for where they live. And that's really two definitions kind of rolled up into one, right? Because that defines absolute poverty and relative poverty. And so absolute poverty is a level of poverty in which one's life is threatened. And this is when someone can't even afford day-to-day -day resources like food, water, shelter, shelter etc. Um, and, and of course, that's all going to be based upon where that person lives, right? If they live in California, the absolute poverty level is going to be a little bit lower than if they were living in a place like, say, Antarctica. Relative poverty, on the other hand, is poverty as compared to others in society. And typically this is given as like a percent below the median income. And in this case, a person's life is not necessarily threatened, but they are excluded from opportunities within society that others may have access to. So just to give you an example of a relative poverty line, uh, we can talk about the one that exists in the United States. So the United States Department of Health and Human Services defines poverty as making less than $12,140 as an individual. It changes depending upon if you have children or how big your family size is, but for an individual, 
It's about $12,000. And this relative poverty metric or this relative poverty line is actually pretty important for a lot of different things. Um, One example that you'll see in healthcare is in the Medicaid program. So Medicaid, which is not to be confused with Medicare, is a government insurance program that provides health insurance to low-income individuals. And It's individuals that are below 138% of this poverty line are the ones that qualify for the full benefits of Medicaid. In other words, if you're an individual, you need to be making a little less than $18,000 to qualify for the full benefits of Medicaid. So this is kind of an interesting example of one way that the U.S. uses this poverty metric that they've come up with. Um, And I should say, too, that for those of you who have a better understanding of the Medicaid system than I do, um, you you know, the the benefits change state to state. So, you know, in some states, it's that you have to be below 100% of the poverty line in order to qualify. Some are 138. It depends upon which states have expanded Medicaid, um, etc. And it's this really big, complicated kind of mess, to be honest. But it's an interesting example. Thanks for checking out the Prospective Doctor MCAT Basics podcast. Sam's doing a killer job taking you through the most important MCAT topics. But what if you need a little extra help? How does a 5, 10, or even 15 point increase in your score sound? Imagine how your chances at admission could increase. Med school coaches MCAT tutoring can get you there. With the most rigorous selection process of any tutoring company, we see amazing results. We deconstruct each student, find a plan that is going to work, and help execute it. That's why our students add an average 12 points to their score. Completely physician-run and operated, and focusing on nothing but medicine. It's no wonder over 10,000 past students have trusted Med School Coach to get them through the MCAT and into medical school. Check out medschoolcoach.com today and mention code PODCAST for 5% off. All right, for the next part of this podcast, I want to talk about social classes. So society can be split up into a bunch of different categories depending upon wealth, education, birthright, influence, status, and a bunch of other things. And these factors that determine social class really depend upon the society that you're looking at. So for instance, within the USA, most people recognize this four-tiered class system that we have, our social class system that we have, where we have the upper class, middle class, the working class, and the lower class. And these classes are largely driven by income levels, right? The upper class are in the top 3% of earners. The middle class are the middle 40% of income earners. The working class is the next 30% of uh, income earners. And then the lower class is the bottom 27% of income earners. So that's how the U.S. social classes are more or less defined. Um, In contrast to that, in ancient India, there was something that's known as the caste system. And to an extent, it's still there today. But a caste system is one that stratifies people based upon the group they are born into. Um, In in India, they had four different classes of people. And I'm going to present these in the order of their importance in the social hierarchy. The first or the most important group of people were known as the Brahmins, and they were priests or intellectuals. The second group of people were called Kshatriyas, and they were warriors or in some cases rulers. And then you had the Vaishyas, who were farmers and merchants, and then last you had the Shudras, who were just laborers or peasants. And these four groups were kept completely separated from one another. They occupied different living colonies. They would only marry within each of these classes. Um, And you couldn't even accept food from someone who was a class below you. And so for the most part, the class that you were born into, you stayed in. In other words, there was no social mobility. Um, And social mobility is an important term to understand and is just the ability for members of of a society to move within or between social strata in society. So for example, you could look at some of these American rags to riches stories where you see people move from the lower class all the way to the upper class, that's social mobility. And in terms of India's caste system, there really was no social mobility or at least very little. 
And there's a few terms regarding social mobility that you should know. The first is vertical mobility, which is either moving up or down the socioeconomic ladder. Then there's horizontal mobility, which is just changing jobs or changing positions, but staying within the same socioeconomic class. And then there's intergenerational mobility, which is changes in your social or your socioeconomic status from a parent to a kid. In other words, say your parent was part of the middle class and then you, the kid, was part of the upper class. And then lastly, there is intragenerational mobility, which are changes in your socioeconomic status throughout your lifetime. An example of this would be like somebody winning the lottery. So say you are in the working class and then you win $15 million in the lottery in the US and now you're in the upper class. That would be an example of intragenerational mobility. All right, so to summarize that, I just gave two examples of how social class structures or systems are very dependent upon the environment you're in. And moreover, they're kind of malleable over time, right? You can move, in some cases, you can move between different uh, rungs of the social mobility ladder. And in some cases, you're stuck where you're at. And again, that all depends upon the environment you're in, um, say the US versus India versus China versus etc. And on the topic of different cultures, there's another term that might come up that you should understand if you see, and that is cultural bias. So cultural bias is interpreting and judging phenomena by the standards of one's own culture. So one example that's kind of gross to think about is the fact that in China, it's completely appropriate to eat dog meat. Um, in, in parts of China, I can't say that for all of China because I don't know, but in parts of China, it's completely appropriate to eat dog meat. And obviously, this is not seen the same way in the U.S. And that's mainly because in our culture, we see dogs as pets and not food. And in the same way, other cultures may look at us eating cows, for instance, and think that that's morally reprehensible, um, even though we think it's completely normal. And so that's just an example of cultural bias. And I should mention, too, that you could argue that just because something is culturally acceptable doesn't mean it's morally the right thing to do. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's something that's important to keep in mind when you're looking at things that other cultures do that you think are strange or not moral or weird or whatever. And it's important to know for the MCAT. And so the last thing I want to talk about in this podcast is the social gradient in healthcare. And so this is the idea that people who are lower on the socioeconomic scale receive poor health care or have poor health outcomes. One's socioeconomic status is defined by a combination of that person's financial income, their level of education, and their occupation, um, if not other factors, and it, which is a little bit different than social class. Social class has more to do with fitting into a particular group of people. Um, and you can look at social class through like the lens of socioeconomic status, but social class can change a little bit, uh, a little bit more based upon the society you're looking at, um, and you had to understand kind of the norms of that group to fit into those specific social classes. Um, so when you hear socioeconomic status, think more about uh, income, education, occupation. And so anyways, scientists have long observed the fact that people that are lower on this socioeconomic scale tend to have worse health outcomes, as I said. And so I was looking at a paper by Paula Braveman and Laura Gottlieb that was titled The Social Determinants of Health. It's time to consider the causes of the causes. Um, and they are both at the UCSF School of Medicine. And what they did in this paper is they presented a lot of data to show this social gradient in healthcare. And what I'm hoping is that when I present some of this data to you, it just gives you a better understanding of what I mean when I say the social gradient in healthcare, or what I mean when I say the social determinants of health. One of the first things they show in this paper is that there's a lower life expectancy based upon your degree of educational attainment. So in this effect is shown for both men and women. So if you look at college graduates versus 
people with no high school degree, you see an almost 10 year decrease in the life expectancy, meaning that the people that don't have a high school degree um, on average tend to live 10 years less or die 10 years earlier. Another thing they show is that the infant mortality rate is higher the less education that you have. So the graph they show shows that people with a high school degree only have essentially twice the rate of infant mortality as compared to college graduates. That's a rate of 3.7 infants per 1,000 for college graduates and 7.7 infants that die per 1,000 for non-high school graduates. And you know, if you look at this plot, you have um, people with less than high school degree, a high school degree, some college and college, and it just looks like a staircase, right? You're just increasing the infant mortality rate as you get less and less education. And then one of the last things they show, and I thought this was pretty interesting, was that you see the same effects across different ethnicities. So whether a person is Asian, Hispanic, white, African American, um, you know, Native American, you see this effect where the less education you have or the less money that you make, the poorer your health outcomes are. And so the obvious question you should have in mind right now is why? Like, why are these health outcomes worse the, the lower on the socioeconomic scale you go? Well, first of all, the, the paper makes it clear that correlation does not equal causation. They say, quote, the aforementioned evidence reflects associations that by themselves do not establish causation. But all the evidence really points to a causal relationship between um, these health outcomes and socioeconomic status. It's obviously hard to prove because, you know, we are correlating two variables together. But just keep this in mind that correlation doesn't always equal causation, but there's so much evidence in this case that we tend to um, assume a causal relationship. So the authors of the paper go on to kind of talk about a few things that could contribute to this effect that's seen. The first is that the first is that access to healthcare is more limited to those on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. And that in itself has plenty of different causes. You know, one being that it's harder for these people who are low income to get insured um, and therefore they might not go access that healthcare because they don't have insurance. Um, you know, they might live in an area where it's hard to go see a primary care physician, or maybe you know they work a lot, so they're not able to go see a primary care physician. Whatever it is, um, you know, the access to healthcare tends to be lower for those on the lower end of that socioeconomic spectrum. Another reason they give is that people in disadvantaged in neighborhoods are more likely to be involved in gun violence, which would then lower their life expectancy. They talk about a lower availability of fresh produce in poor areas. They talk about environmental toxins and, and pollutants that these poor areas may be more exposed to. So there's a million of these different factors that could cause these effects and probably do contribute in some way to these effects. But you got to understand that this correlation between low socioeconomic status and poor health outcomes is not just due to like one variable that we could quickly and easily fix, right? There's a million factors that are involved. Um, but what the paper does do is it does lay out three different things that healthcare providers can do to start to be able to fix some of these things. They say that number one, the healthcare provider can understand this subject um, and educate themselves on this subject. They say number two, that the healthcare provider can do research so that they can better understand this topic and better provide information to other healthcare providers um, so that they can understand the topic better. And then lastly, they suggest that healthcare providers can go advocate for healthcare policy changes whether it be at the state level, the local government level, federal government level, that can have a positive influence on, or, or positive effect, I guess, on these patients that are lower on the socioeconomic scale. Overall, I think the kind of important takeaway for the MCAT is just to understand that research shows that socioeconomic status, in particular 
education level and income have a positive correlation with healthcare outcomes. In other words, as your socioeconomic status goes up, so does your health outcomes. And that is it for this episode of Perspective Doctors MCAT Basics. As always, if you like this podcast and feel like it helped, go leave us a review on iTunes or tell your friends about it. Um, Anybody you know who's studying for the MCAT, tell them about it. We always appreciate that. Good luck as you continue studying for the MCAT and as you probably get closer to taking it. Thanks for listening to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast. If you're a pre-med, you'll want to check out prospectivedoctor.com for tons of free tools, articles, and more podcasts that cover your pre-med life. And if you need help on the MCAT or getting into med school, check out med